Good morning, church. It's good to be back. It's good to have some clean parking lots. Thanks to our Keebler elf, Clint Draper. Uh, he was out here with his trusty tractor and cleaning all that off for us. And we've been blessed. And thank you, Clint. You know, he gave the open announcements. He couldn't really thank himself. So I, I wanted to do that. But glad Linda and Ray are back. They were down in Texas during all that havoc, probably the worst week in their whole life they could ever choose to go to Texas, but it was good. He was down with his mother and his sister and I'm sure helped them out and stay warm. So um, if you're visiting with us, we're thankful for your presence. We'd like to ask you to take one of those blue cards in front of you there in the back of the pew and just fill it out and then pass it to one of these inside aisles or give it to me or keep somebody and we want to have a record of your presence. Okay, uh, let's... Uh, Let's read Matthew chapter 14, verses 1 through 12. Matthew chapter 14, verses 1 through 12. And this is a, a, a sad, sad story because John the Baptist, who Jesus himself said was more than a prophet. There is nobody born of a woman greater than he, Jesus said. And, uh, and yet, because of his goodness, because of his will to serve God, he is... Put to death. First of all, he's in prison. Uh, Herod puts him in prison because John the Baptist uh, told him that it wasn't lawful, wasn't permitted to him to have his brother's wife. His, his brother's wife divorced him and married uh, Herod Antipas, or it'll call, we call him Herod the Tetrarch, but his name was uh, Antipas. And so he had his brother's wife. And so John the Baptist comes and tells him that's not right. Well, so often people mistake moral decisions or criticisms or points of view or, or truth to, uh, into political, want to politicize things like we do abortion. You know, we've made that a political thing. Well, our party's for it. Our party's against. No, everybody should be against. That's a moral decision. It's not a political decision. And so I imagine Herod saw John the Baptist as a threat to his authority. And it could uh, shaken his uh, power there in Judea. And so he had John put in prison. And certainly Herodias didn't like it. Most likely because she felt guilty because she was doing something obviously that was wrong. And uh, so she wanted not only him to be put in prison, but he, she wanted him to, to put to death. But, but Herod wasn't ready for that. He didn't want to do that. He knew uh, that John the Baptist was a just man. And as a matter of fact, the Bible says he even liked to listen to him. And so let's begin reading in verse 1 of chapter 14 about what really happened here. And, and uh, maybe we can learn some things from this. Verse 1, I'm reading from the English Standard Version. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard about the fame of Jesus. And he said to his servants, this is John the Baptist. He's been raised from the dead. That is why these mir miraculous powers are at work in him. So he's scared. This is telling us what happened, and, and he had already put John the Baptist to death, but he's thinking that Jesus now is John coming back, and because he's come back from the dead, he has powers to do miracles. That's why Jesus does miracles. Verse 3. For Herod had seized John and bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because John had been saying to him, It is not lawful for you to have her. And though he wanted to put him to death... He feared, talking about Herod, Herod feared the people because they held him to be a prophet. But when Herod's birthday came, the daughter of Herodias danced before the company and pleased Herod. Now, uh, from other passages, we read that there were military authorities there and important people from society. And so everybody was, it was a big extravagant party. And Herodias' daughter, uh, uh, actually Herodias was uh, a niece to Herod. And now her daughter's dancing. And uh, so uh, verse six, but when Herod's birthday came, the daughter of Herodias danced before the company and pleased Herod. Verse seven, so that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she might ask. Other uh, parallel passages say up to half his kingdom. So most likely he had been drinking quite a bit, got uh, enthused. And everybody was enthused, thought it was a beautiful presentation of some sort, maybe even a lustful presentation, whatever happened. But he promises uh, up to half his kingdom. And verse 8, prompted by her mother, 
She said, give me the head of John the Baptist here on a platter. So other passages tell us that, that Herodias' daughter went to her and said, what should I ask for? You know, a new car, house on the beach. And she says, no, I want the head of John the Baptist. So that's what Herodias' daughter asked uh, Herod for. Uh, verse 9, and the king was sorry. But because of his oaths and his guest, he commanded it to be given. How often do people do things they don't want to do, but they feel pressured by the, the acceptance of their peers, their friends, society? And rather than going back and say, no, that's not right. I, I, I was wrong. I shouldn't have done that. He tries to save face and says, OK, even though he knew that John was a holy man, the other passages will talk to us about. But he went ahead and said, no, he didn't want to be shamed in front of his his friends and his colleagues and the authorities there. So he said, go, go get his head. Verse 10, he sent and had John beheaded in the prison and his head was brought on a platter and given to the girl and she brought it to her mother. And the disciples came and took the body and buried it. And they went and told Jesus. Well, as I was preparing for this lesson, I looked at uh, various uh, paintings uh, from several hundred years ago about this uh, situation. And you'll see paintings where uh, Herodias' daughter is carrying this platter with John's head on it. It's, it's very gruesome to see that. And uh, obviously I didn't want to show something like that, but can you imagine the type of people uh, that would bring in somebody's head? No matter who it was, no matter how horrible, in the middle of a party. So obviously these are some people with, that are far from God. But now the Bible says that his disciples heard about it, the last, last verse there, in verse 12. And his disciples came and took the body and buried it out of respect for John. And then they went and told Jesus. You know, John was not only a great and faithful man of God, uh, but he was prophesied about hundreds of years ago to come. He was the Elijah who was to come and, and prepare the hearts and minds of the people for the coming of the Messiah, Jesus. John was uh, born in a miraculous way as Jesus was. Uh, his mother Elizabeth was too old to have children, and yet God caused her to, uh, to conceive and, and to give birth to John the Baptist. So he was very special. And he's the one that pointed out to the, the disciples that, this, that Jesus is the Lamb of God. And now they have to go and tell Jesus that John's dead. Well, what I want us to observe this morning is what was Jesus' reaction? How did he how did he react to hearing the news about John's death? Now, when Jesus heard this, he withdrew there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. <clears throat> Eleven years ago, I was here in Lebanon, back on a furlough. It was on a Sunday morning, and uh, the next day I would go to Ohio to see my family I hadn't seen over a year. And, uh, but I got a telephone call from my brother-in-law telling me about my mother. I passed away. I just found her. She had gone out on the porch, picked up a newspaper, came back in the house, took off the rubber band and just fell over dead right there. And, uh, and, and my father had died uh, three years prior to that. And I had the same reaction. And, I, and it, in some sense, it was surprising to me. I, I didn't expect that I would just be so overwhelmed over. I mean, I would be sad, obviously, but just uncontrollably so. And my reaction is, I just wanted to be by myself. I needed time alone. So I just stayed back in the bedroom there and Becky and the family gave me uh, that space. I just needed that time. And then, of course, I'm, to this day, I'm not all, <laughs> all right, but, but I needed that 
to get over uh, or, or to deal with that. It was a shock. And so uh, I, w- I want us to talk about this morning ab- about grief. And three years ago, I had a, a message on grief and, and how to deal with grief. How do we deal when we're, we've lost uh, loved ones? We've had a lot of, of deaths uh, this past year, not only members of the congregation, but uh, family members. Uh, as a matter of fact, since I've been here at Highland Heights, uh, we probably have five, six, seven deaths in the congregation every year, and, and then plus family members. And so, you know, that's, that's been a lot of, of death, and we've faced a lot of grief. Uh, just last year, uh, be, this Thursday will be a year ago, uh, Will Roberts passed away. And it's just, you know, to this day, it's hard to, how do we handle that? Well, I don't want us to focus a whole lot, actually, because I, I, I gave that sermon. And, but I, I want us to focus on other things that, that cause us grief as well. Not just, uh, obviously, when someone dies, we, we, we grieve. It's just the way we have to deal with it. It's because we love and we care. Uh, but other things can cause grief in us as well. Certainly not as, uh, as you know, on a grand scale. Most people think, well, that's not that bad compared to a death of a loved one. Probably not. But it still causes us to grieve. But what I want this lesson this morning to help us with is to uh, prepare for when those things do come. Because the reality is, when you come to a situation that's going to cause you grief, if you don't really understand grief, you don't know how to deal with it, it's probably going to be too late to deal with it uh, or try to learn about it. Because obviously when, when you're grieving, your emotions are so mixed up and you have a hard time thinking. It, it clouds our thinking. Uh, they say that you shouldn't make any major decisions in the first year after uh, 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 death of a loved one because your thinking's not as clear as it should be. So uh, there are things that you've got to know before you need to know. <laughs> if you're going to drive a car, you're first driving, you're learning how to drive a car, you need to know how to stop that car uh, before you ever even turn it on. There are a lot of things you need to know before you need to know them, okay? For example, uh, whoops, five, uh, 50 years ago this year, well, I made my first trip on an airplane. Uh, I had never flown before. I uh, went to Brazil as an exchange student, went on Vatic Airlines. And back in those days, they were all propeller planes. And uh, I didn't know, you know, I, obviously, intellectually, I knew that the bottom wouldn't fall out when we took off, but I didn't know how it would feel. So when we took off, it was kind of like, uh, I don't know, <laughs> never flown before. <laughs> and, uh, but you quickly learned that there's this safety card in the back of every seat. You should read it uh, and uh, pay attention to those safety instructions. Uh, the flight attendants uh, will, will tell you where the exit doors are in case of an emergency landing. They'll tell you where the bathrooms are. They'll tell you, look, you should count how many seats to the nearest exit. They may be behind you, not in front of you. You should count because if the plane went down and the lights went out or if it was overturned, you may not be able to see. And so that way you could count you know, how many. And they'll tell you who can sit at the exit doors and how you would operate that. Uh, Also, you need to know how to use an oxygen mask. Um, Sometimes the oxygen of the plane might uh, be insufficient, and these masks will drop from the ceiling, and you should learn how to put that on you, over you, and that not the bag won't necessarily inflate, but you'll still get oxygen. You should put it over yourself first before you help somebody else. Um, And you should know how to use a life vest in case you have a water landing, and you put it on, but you don't inflate it until you get outside of the the airplane because water could get in the airplane. It might hinder you from getting out and everything. And so there's a lot of things you just got to know before you need to know it. Otherwise, as if after your plane's crashed or it's going down and you get out your card, let me see. I've never really paid attention. Where's the light? What do I do? How do I put this man? Or you don't have oxygen. You say, well, what do I do now? So you need to know before you need to know. OK, so grief is an intense sorrow and especially at the death of a loved one. But Grief can also result from losing, for example, your marriage to divorce. When someone dies, obviously you've lost your marriage. But people don't expect, that people don't get married to divorce. They don't expect, we expect sometime one of our spouse will die, but you don't expect a divorce. And that can cause some serious, serious grieving. Um, maybe in some ways even worse than a death because it's like a death, but the corpse is walking around. Uh, 
also maybe your child, uh, you know, you're losing your child to the world. I'm obviously, uh, when, as a Christians, we raise our children to love God, to serve God, but that's, we're, that's not always in our hands. We, we, we can't control, you know, you, you can guide your children, you can train them, you can teach them, but in the end, we're not, they're responsible for their own decisions and, and they don't always make the decisions that we want. And when they decide to turn their backs on God, it hurts as bad as, as, a, as a death. And uh, also uh, financial stability. If you lose your financial stability, we first went to Brazil. We didn't, uh, I had raised support to go to Brazil as a single person um, four years before I actually went. And I got married in the meantime. And there was four years of extreme high inflation in Brazil. So we got there and we really didn't have money. I did, I did have a car, but I didn't have money. I, it wasn't mandatory, but I didn't have money to pay for insurance for my car. Becky wouldn't buy certain fruits and we never ate out uh, like a meal. We might get some, a sandwich someplace where it was cheaper, but we financially, it was tough. Our, our baby was born. We didn't have a baby bed. We put him in a bed with us at first, and then we put him in a clothes basket, and then finally somebody gave us a baby. We didn't have money to buy that kind of things, but it was okay. <laughs> That's all we knew. It was our life, and we were blessed. But today, <laughs> I'm not ready to go back to living that kind of, well, not having young babies either. But, <laughs> but, but when you lose your financial stability, there was a, a, a brother at church um, Mauro, and, and he came from a simple lifestyle, but uh, he, he worked hard and eventually he bought a, a big a dump truck and he worked hard and made more money and bought a second dump truck and a third and then eventually got into big trucks. And eventually he had a small, a relatively nice trucking company. He had 17 trucks. Scania, uh, Scania, I don't know if you say that in English, the truck brand. Uh, but big semi trucks and he had 17 and he bought farms and he would travel the states and bring his family. He was very generous, helped the church, lived in a penthouse, an apartment and everything. Well, the economy went down. His partner stole from him. In the end, he lost everything, everything he had. And he got so depressed. And then what just was the straw that broke the camel's back in his life his daughter was going to get married and he didn't have money to do anything to help his daughter's wedding. It killed him. Literally, it killed him. And he took rat poisoning. He went to a supermarket and bought rat poisoning, and sat there in his car and swallowed. Well, they called the, the ambulance and they, he was in the hospital for a week and he repented, wrote the church letter. He couldn't talk. It destroyed his vocal cords and everything. But he wrote the church a letter, apologized and everything, but he died. He died because it's, it's devastating. It, obviously, it's, it's not as bad as losing a loved one, but, but it's real. Losing your marriage to a divorce, losing a child to the world, your financial stability, also your health. You know, uh, for years I, I counseled with, I counseled a, a man in Brazil who had some serious health problems. And as a young kid, I always just thought, well, just, I never said this, but I always thought, just get over it. I mean, that's your situation now. You're never going to get better, but just get over it and get on with life. You know, there's, but in 89, when I blew my knee out at church camp playing soccer against the young guys, uh, I couldn't do much for two years. I had to have screws and ACL replacement and everything. And then I saw how your physical affects your emotional and your mental and even maybe your spiritual. And so if you lose your health, or you're used to being, you know, getting up and going and doing things and then your back goes out and you're struggling with that or maybe a hip or whatever. It's, it's very devastating. Also, uh, the young people won't understand this, but if you use your, lose your youth, which eventually if you live long enough, you, you'll do that. It's hard. It's hard getting old, isn't it, Bob? It's hard getting old. It's like... Sherry has to put up with you. We get crankier. We yell, get off my lawn, right? Because things bother us more. We get more irritable because life is harder. You forget things. You, you know, you can't get off the floor <laughs> down with the grandkids. And you can't get back up. It's, it's not easy. It's not easy and can cause some serious grief. Also, uh, when you lose your country, 
I'm not talking about a military coup. I'm talking about a social uh, general turning your back on God. This is not the America that a lot of us grew up in. It's not. When you are, have to be sort of embarrassed for being patriotic, what's that about? And people are rioting and, and burning and, and, and they're being applauded as some kind of social heroes. What's that about? Politicians, and, or, it's, just, it's just all crazy. And so that can cause real grief as well. And then last of all, uh, if you lose your church and you think, well, how can you lose your church? Well, this is something I wanted to bring out because we're getting ready to move to a new building. We're the same church, but we're going to a new building. But it, for a lot of people, it's going to feel like it's a different church, right? Some of you out here have been, this is the only church you've ever been to in your whole life. And even though it'll be the same people, but everything's going to be different for a while. And it's not going to see this, seem the same. And even though we're excited and we're happy, but, but I kind of miss going over there. And so I want, I want you to be aware of that. And I've already heard some comments, kind of not, not uh, negative comments in the sense, I don't want to go and we shouldn't leave, but just I'm going to miss this place. And uh, so that's going to happen. And not just the location, but the logistics are going to be different. The, the, the church makeup on, in time is going to be different. Very quickly, uh, the Lord willing. And I say that because uh, every church wants to grow. I mean, Jesus said to go out and make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's what we're about. We're here uh, to be and to make disciples of Jesus. And so... Uh, I believe with all my heart we're going to have lots of opportunities, contacts, people looking for God. People maybe have been out of the church and want to come back. People have never been to church and want to see what we're about, want to hear. So I think we're going to have wonderful opportunities. But it's going to change the feel. It's going to change the way things go. Uh, relationships with people. You might see a whole lot of people you don't know. Or maybe they're not like me or like you. And they're going to be, seem different. And it's just going to, uh, the dynamics are going to, going to be different. And even though intellectually and spiritually we want the church to grow, but emotionally a lot of churches don't grow because they really don't want to. Not because they're bad people, not because they, they want to keep the gospel all to themselves, but it's just such a nice family. We've all been together here for so many years and we love each other and we know what to expect and we know who, who everybody is. But that's probably going to change. And it might cause some grief for some people. And it should. Some of the younger people are like, well, I don't, this is great. And, you know, I don't, you know, but, but just trust me. It, it, it could cause some grief. But know that, that you can deal with it. And God will bless you with it. And we're going to talk about how uh, to do that. But first of all, what are some manifestations of grief? What are some things that, that happen in your life uh, when you are grieving or you're going through the, a sense of, of deep, uh, loss. Well, one of the first things is shock. And as I mentioned, uh, Thursday will be a year ago that, that Will Roberts passed away. Becky and I were down in Brazil and we got that information and it was a shock. And, and to this day, I haven't gotten over it. Imagine uh, Ashley and Chris. So it's a shock. It's like, wow, we didn't expect that. And, and not just with somebody young. Uh, Becky, you know, with anybody, even if they've been sick for a while, you know, you think, well, they'll always get better or even if you're expecting it, but still when it happens, it's, it's a shock. And, and it's just, even though we know that we'll all die sooner or later, but still it's just one of the things that, that happens. We just, we just can't believe it. Secondly, it's denial. And I've told this story before that the, uh, the exchange student that was in our home uh, in, in December 1972, his father uh, in Brazil, was killed in an automobile accident, and they called me and, and asked him to come home, send him home right away. And uh, I told him, and he talked on the phone. They told him, and after we hung up, he just kept saying, no, my, my dad didn't die. I'm sure my dad didn't die. And he left thinking that his dad didn't die. Maybe it was kind of a self-protection, you know, emotional thing to protect himself, and it probably was good so he could get back in, in one piece. But Denial. People just can't believe that when a loved one passes away, you know, you just expect any time now they'll become walking through that door or you'll wake up and, and see it was just a dream. Uh, it's denial. It's part of grieving. Certainly pain 
emotional pain. Uh, but it can even cause physical pain. You know, uh, stress can cause heart attacks in people. Well, grief can cause uh, serious inflammation in the body. It can even cause people to die, actually, when it gets so bad. And so uh, there's shock and denial. There's pain and guilt. Uh, you know, if I had only made my wife go to the doctor, she said she was okay, but I could tell she wasn't. And it's my fault because I should have just put her in the car and taken her. And, or, or, if, or if he hadn't, my husband hadn't drank so much, or, you know, if, if, if my brother hadn't messed with drugs and I could have stopped him, you know, and I told him, but I just didn't do enough. And, and those kind of things come. And, and children, uh, we talked about losing your marriage to divorce. Uh, so often children have been seen to, to feel guilty when their parents divorce. For some reason, somehow they think that they're guilty of their parents' divorce. There's the reason their parents divorced. So that's part of grieving. Also, anger. Um, we get angry at the person who died. Why didn't you go to the doctor when I told you? Or why did you, why did you, you know, live such an unhealthy lifestyle? Or anger at the doctors. Why didn't they do enough? I know one lady, and she was telling me how upset she was at the hospital and the doctors because her, her father passed away. Well, it was a brain aneurysm. <laughs> what? What could have anybody have done? And uh, it's, it's a normal thing for a person to die. It's rare that somebody survives that. And uh, she's angry. Uh, not, you know, not out of control angry, but it's just that anger that is part of the grief uh, process. And then, and then last of all, among many other symptoms, would, is depression and loneliness. Now, when you're grieving, you can't think clearly. And... Uh, you're certainly not a, a very happy person to be around, very enjoyable person to be around, and, and that, certainly that would cause more loneliness and depression. And, uh, you know, sometimes people need uh, medicine to help them during their depression so that they can work through their grief. Not, to, not that they would live off of depression medicines for the rest of their lives, but just to help them to get to a place where they can work through all that. And so you may need to go see a doctor. It's, it's not a lack of faith. God's given us those uh, resources to be able to help us through that. So um, it's been said, Rose Kennedy uh, was quoted as saying, it's been said, time heals all wounds. I do not agree. The wounds remain. In time, the mind, protecting its sanity, covers them with scar tissue and the pain lessens, but it's never gone. Uh, Vicki Harrison said, grief is like the ocean. It comes on waves ebbing and flowing. Sometimes the water's calm and sometimes it's overwhelming. All we can do is learn to swim. And so uh, grieving, it's not like 24 hours a day necessarily. Maybe you're out with some friends having a good time. And in the middle of that, or, or just after you get home, you, you, you decide you want to tell your spouse about the great time you had, and then you realize that spouse is not there anymore. So uh, grieving is, is a process. Hopefully you'll, you'll learn to, to not uh, overcome it, but just to live with it. Now, grief resolution is, it, it, when we can say that we've resolved our grief, grief, is when we're able to accept the loss and the consequent changes uh, that it brings and then also to able to experience joy and satisfaction in life again uh, because until you're able to enjoy life again it, it's been said that can last anywhere from six months typically to four years and, and, and possibly longer but the, the average time is six months to four years and so that's what we're we're striving uh, to attain is grief resolution now how do we uh, help someone in their grief? And we'll close here with these five last five points. First of all, don't try to minimize their pain. Oh, it's okay. You know, everybody loses their job or, or you know, everybody loses a spouse. and You'll be fine. You know, you've, he left you plenty. You know, no, that doesn't take away anybody's pain. And they need to go through that grieving process. Secondly, uh, ask yourself, are you truly trying to help for their benefit or yours. Galatians 6.2 says to bear one another's burdens. But sometimes we want people to get over their burdens because it's burdening me. <laughs> like, I'm really having a hard time with you having a hard time. And so let's get out here and see if we can fix you. But that's not what we should be doing. The third uh, way that we can help people in their grief is uh, grieve with others and for as long as it may take. 
Um, we don't know how long that takes. Hopefully, it'll get less and less. Hopefully, they'll do better. But 1 Corinthians 13 says that love is patient, it's kind, it bears all things, endures all things, and never ends. So if you really love that person, be patient and help them in their grieving process. Number four, don't be afraid, afraid to talk about the loss. You know, I, I've typically have been that way in the past. Oh, I don't want to bring up this person's spouse because I don't want to make them feel bad again. Or I don't want to talk about Will Roberts because that'll make Chris and Ashley feel bad. No, they know he's passed away. The person that's lost a spouse, they know they passed. You're not reminded. They, you're not bringing it. Oh, I forgot. Thank you. No, they don't want that person to be forgotten. They're still alive in their hearts. They would love them as much as ever. And so it, it's good for people to be able to talk about the one they lost or, or maybe the health problem that they had or, or the automobile accident or, or a child that they lost to the world, something. So don't be afraid to talk about the loss. And then last of all, pray for them. If you really care, if you really want to help, just pray. The prayer of a righteous person has great power. And that's what the Bible says. And so... Um, those are five uh, ideas that, that can hopefully help you to help somebody who's grieving. But last of all, most important is that uh, we need to remember that life can be hard for all of us. And, and Jesus is the only answer. Let's stand and sing.